on your mind, and I want to try to discuss those subjects, not give you some long lecture. Let me just, then, you can start whenever you want. Uh, let me just start, I think, by trying in about two minutes to describe to you kind of the difference in American foreign policy and how you manage it today as against when I was going to school here, which was some time before the Civil War. <laughs> uh, no, seriously, in the late 40s, early 50s, when the U.S. was without any doubt the preeminent power in the world, we had all of the economic strength, we had overwhelming military strength, and although we felt and thought in those days that the Soviet Union was in fact a threat, which I don't argue that it was, in retrospect I think it's clear to everybody that the Soviet Union was in nowhere near the position we were, although at the time they scared us a lot. But at that time we could manage foreign policy largely by either throwing money at the problem or on occasion arms at the problem, weapons, and in, on occasion troops. But we bought our way through a lot of those years in foreign policy, and we could afford it. Today, we're in a quite different situation. You can argue and debate, and that argument and debate is now going on as whether the Soviet Union is militarily stronger than we are or not. I think it's basically irrelevant which one of us is stronger, because the fact of the matter is that the Soviet Union is extremely powerful. So are we. Uh, either one of us can wipe a good many of the citizens of the other country off the face of the earth if they want to. So we are now faced, as we were never before in our history, with a principal rival that is, in military terms at least, if not equal to us, certainly close to equal to us in strength. So that imposes immediately tremendous limitations we did not have to face before. Secondly, we've seen since the early 50s the growth of a whole new world, which we call the Third World, the old colonial uh, areas, which now are themselves independent countries, extremely demanding in terms of resources and assistance, and extremely unsettling in terms of trying to deal with maintaining some sort of world stability. The, the importance of the Third World, aside from the specific countries themselves, I think, is that if World War III starts, it could well start in one of those by the U.S. and the Soviet Union coming into, coming into conflict, and that war then expanding, or if not World War III, at least the danger of any number of regional wars which we might be drawn into. Thirdly, our own resources, while we are still the richest country in the world, in case you've missed it, we are in a recession. The Congress is not uh, particularly anxious to be spending money on foreign assistance, and we can no longer throw money at problems the way that we used to be able to. Now, what does this mean? It means, in effect, that if we are to conduct a foreign policy, it has to be conducted with a good bit more sophistication, a good bit more planning ahead, and a great deal more public support than used to be the case. Now, I have to tell you, I think that introduces some serious problems, because I think the th third point is the most important. Ever since the Vietnam War, we have not had the public consensus on foreign policy that we used to have, where by and large most of the American people believe in a particular course of action in foreign policy, and therefore the government was able to conduct its foreign policy with some stability and some sense that from administration to administration the same general policy would be carried out. One of our major problems right now is that that consensus no longer exists, and in fact, there are substantial changes from administration to administration on foreign policy, and indeed, during an administration on occasion, there are major changes, which is fine insofar as the average American is concerned. It's, you know, it's a democracy exercising the rights of a democracy to change its policy. It is extremely difficult, and I would say extremely dangerous, when you are, however, the leader of a, I will say it, the free world. And you have a lot of countries out around the world who count on us, and as they pin their tail to our kite, they want to know 
that two years from now our policies will by and large be the same as they are now. They want to have some sense of reliability that the U.S. as a leader, one, will continue to lead, and secondly, that the policies that they, that the U.S. adopts with regard to any country, but in general the policies we adopt, will in fact still be the policies three or four years from now. I want to end this already too long conversation simply by saying I would suggest to you that while we have any number of <coughs> foreign policy problems, whether it's Central America, Soviet Union, Europe, any area we want to talk about, our principal foreign policy problem is not any one of those areas. It is this question of whether the U.S. can lead the Western world and can do it with some stability and some confidence and some sense on the part of our allies and friends that we will be on that same policy five years from now and that therefore they can afford to associate themselves with us. Now, I want to stop right now. I really do want to get into some discussion. I want to find out what's on your mind. I'm prepared to try to answer any question on any subject other than the potato crop in Portage County this year. <laughs> Uh, and I really would ask you to argue with me. So let's get started. I hope somebody has a question. <coughs> yes, sir. Do you believe that the United States can find a way to lead the Western world in foreign policy? And if they have already have, if they have already developed it, do you believe in it? Well, I think we we already lead, and we have for, since the war. My point is. Yeah, I think we can manage the problem, but I think it is an extremely difficult problem, and I think it is one that is by and large not understood by the American people, the point I was trying to make, which is it is, the, it is, the, it is if you will, the conflict between being able to maintain a steady foreign policy and the normal functioning of a democratic institutions. It is easy for the Soviet Union to maintain a consistent foreign policy. It is also easy for the Soviet Union to do a 180 degree turn on its foreign policy in two days if it wants to, because it doesn't have to worry about explaining what it's done to the average Soviet citizen. Nor does it have to worry about, it doesn't have to worry about Soviet citizen support for the intervention in Afghanistan. By and large, the Soviet people don't even know what's going on. So they're able to operate kind of, not totally in a vacuum, but they can manage their foreign policy, as can almost any dictatorship, without much reference to public opinion. Not always, but in general. We've got this system which, while when it, you know, in terms of uh, the decisions themselves, they are far more acceptable to people because we do debate them and make up our own minds. But what we need to keep in mind is that the policies we decide on today that lead countries around the world to decide to ally themselves with us to stay with us. Let me take an example, Pakistan, which sits on the border of Afghanistan. And without Pakistan, I can tell you the Afghan rebels would not be able to maintain their fight against the, the Soviets. Pakistan wants to be allied with the U.S., but it also is kind of on the front line. It wants to know that if it associates itself closely with the U.S., Two years from now, we're not going to say, well, we've kind of changed our minds. We're not really interested in maintaining that close relationship with you. We've got, they've got other places to spend the money or other ways to fry our fish, and we're no longer going to be tied in very closely with you, at which point Pakistan is sort of hanging out there on the end of a limb. That's a simple example, but it's, it is, in my view, it is the essential major foreign policy problem we have, which is, and mind you, Vietnam, Watergate, uh, they had played, they had a tremendous impact, one, on our own self-confidence, and two, on looking at how we were going to deal with the rest of the world over the rest of this century. And we have obviously, and I think rightly, been confused and sort of trying to sort our way through those problems and try to decide what the proper role of the U.S. is in the world for the rest of this century. But in the process, we have shaken the faith and confidence that a number of countries around the world have placed in us one, in our ability to lead, and secondly, in our ability to lead in a steady manner. And the final point I guess I would make here is that the United States simply has no choice but to be a leader. Because if we don't lead, 
<clears throat> there's nobody to take our place. In that sense, the U.S. is and has been since the Second World War in a position it never faced before. Because if we wanted to opt out of world affairs, we could. And Britain and France and other countries could fill in behind us. They all did a brilliant job, by the way. But the fact of the matter is that if we opt out of that leadership role now, or if we don't recognize as people that there is a, a role of leadership that we must exercise whether we like it or not and whether we like the costs or not, there is no other choice. There's nobody to take of, the place. What about some of the um, countries in South America? Aren't they becoming, getting into positions of leadership for the South American countries? Sure, the Brazilians can fill a regional role. Uh, the Europeans can fill a regional and somewhat larger role. But there's nobody who can, has the power or the ability to operate on a global scale. And that's what we're dealing with now is foreign policy problems on a global scale. Whether we like it or not, what happens in Indonesia at some point or another impacts on your life and mine. And we'd better, therefore, be in a, in a position at least to try to manage those problems. Uh, please, let's go on. Yes, sir. Um, you said that we can't just start uh, or keep on throwing money at problems and we should be uh, more sophisticated in how we're dealing with these. How are we going to deal with, uh, take El Salvador, for instance, how are we going to deal with a problem right now if you're saying that we we can't throw money at it, we should be more sophisticated. How would we deal with that right now? Well, the answer to that is we're going to have to deal with that one by throwing money at it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, you know, and it's a perfectly legitimate question, and you, you pin me on a generalization that has to have exceptions. What I, what I was saying is that in the past, because we were as wealthy as we were and because the world was as simple as it was, we could take care of a lot of our foreign policy problems by throwing money at it. The Marshall Plan is an example, and it worked beautifully. There are any other, many other examples. Today, one, we don't have the resources. Two, the problems are far more broad. The third world, as, an, as a major economic problem, if nothing else, has far exceeded what it was 30 years ago. We have to deal, use other tools far more, the sorts of tools that Europeans have used for years, which namely, in part, are a more <coughs> adept diplomacy and more involvement uh, in diplomatic methods and in terms of arguing about issues and discussing questions and trying to bring people along through uh, discussion rather than simply using resources. But having said that, that does not mean, and I would like to get into a discussion with Salvador if anybody here is interested, that does not mean that on certain issues we do not have to still consider the use of ma fairly massive expenditures or resources. I'm not arguing that we shouldn't have an aid program or we shouldn't have a military assistance program worldwide. I happen to think they are absolutely <coughs> critical to the U.S. maintaining leadership in the world. But I am saying we have to be f more discreet in the issues we try to point to and deal with that way because we simply cannot cope with all the problems in the world using those methods only. Somebody want to talk about Salvador? I get a feeling that around the country that a lot of people your age think we're nuts. What is the situation right now? Well, let me see if I can't get an, at least some sort of an argument started by just talking about Salvador. I, I wish I could get some debate here. <coughs> My sense of it, and Lord knows if you stay in Washington very long, you very quickly lose touch with what goes on in the rest of the country, which is why coming out here is worthwhile, if you'll make it worthwhile by arguing with me a little. <laughs> Uh, my sense of it is, though, that there is great disquiet over what the administration is trying to do in Central America. There are those who talk about Vietnam and another Vietnam in Central America. There are a great many others who talk legitimately and rightly about human rights violations in the area, about the murder of the nuns and the failure of the Salvador government to deal with that subject. Let me start by saying I think, and I say this not simply because I'm on television or because there's, I work for this administration, I deeply believe we are following the right course, and I want to try to explain to you why. Let me start by saying I would not debate for a minute that in most of the countries of Central America, with the exception of Costa Rica, there are major social, political, and economic injustices that have lasted for years 
and indeed to some degree the United States over the course of the last 50 to 100 years has played a part, and I emphasize only a part, in those social injustices. By and large, I refuse to accept the view that we are responsible every time a sparrow falls from the sky anywhere in the world. And by and large, I would say that people <coughs> of Central America are by and large responsible for their own problems, but we have on occasion contributed to them. The fact of the, I mean, I'll narrow the focus for a moment to El Salvador. The fact of the matter is that this is a country that has been run for decades by a small oligarchy of rich landholders. The fact of the matter also is, however, that over the course of the last five or six years, that oligarchy has largely been driven from the country. There has been a major land reform program, and people who never before held land now hold a fair amount of land. It is a government which has tried, particularly under a man named Duarte, who was a Christian, a Christian Democratic candidate probably for president this time, has tried major reforms, recognizing that it is a backward country in which they've never known democracy, and it's hard to build that. One, it's hard to build democratic institutions. Secondly, it's hard to build respect for human rights. But they have tried, and I think had some real successes. I think it is hard, for example, to argue against the demonstration of the Salvador election a year ago, where an awful lot of people risked their lives to go to the polls and vote. There is in El Salvador a guerrilla movement of somewhere between three and 5,000 people dedicated to their task, well-trained, who have been conducting a guerrilla war in that country with some success for some years. I would suggest to you that it is, given Salvador as it is anyway, it's difficult to establish democratic institutions. It is particularly difficult in the middle of a civil war. Nevertheless, they have done, I think, reasonably well. The argument now is whether these guerrillas should be able to force their way into the government at the point of a bayonet. We are, let me finish, then you can take me on it. Let's take another minute. We, this country, the Reagan administration, is not arguing at all that the guerrilla should not be permitted to participate in the electoral process. We want that. We want to bring them into the electoral process, let them fight in the, in the arena of the ballot box for support in El Salvador. They say, no, they want to share power. Now, if you believe, and this is one of the, the arguments that I find difficult to understand I get a lot these days is complaints about the failure of the Salvadoran government to move toward democracy more rapidly. At the same time, the same people argue, but you ought to bring the guerrillas into the government. And I ask you if that really is democratic. You don't fight your, you, you wouldn't accept in the government of the United States somebody who came in at the point of a bayonet. I don't know why we should expect that in El Salvador. Now, it's our view that you need to support the process of democratization in El Salvador. You also need to support the government in El Salvador, and that that's going to require some money for the Salvadoran military, as well as some economic assistance. Let me make one final point, and then I will stop. Remember what it is that we're dealing with in that guerrilla movement. And that is, in my view, the evidence is overwhelming. They are, by and large, Marxists. Not all of them, but by and large they are Marxists. They receive their military equipment and a great deal of their military advice from Cuba and the Soviet Union. I have to assume that if they are close to the Cubans and the Soviets, they have a certain view of the United States which is likely not to be particularly friendly. And I would ask you to think down the road five or ten years, if these people should be able to take over in El Salvador, take over in Honduras and Guatemala, whether that doesn't begin to create, potentially at least, a serious strategic problem for the United States to its south that we have never in our history had to face, and precisely at a point when we are under the greatest challenge in any number of other areas of the world. And is it not, therefore, in the U.S. national interests 
if you pay foreign poli people like me to try to think several years down the road on occasion, can't I at least make the argument that we ought to be doing now what we can to prevent that infection from spreading and in the meantime trying to cure the diseases that have led to the infection in the first place, rather than let it get much worse and then have to face that challenge in a far more virulent fashion some years down the road? Yes, sir. I, it sounds like, you know, big dominoes here. Um, you know, this country's going to fall to Marxism, and then <coughs> all the rest are going to fall, and then we're going to have them on our back door. Uh, why, why do you think that uh, the guerrillas are rebelling right now? Why do you think the, the leftists are? Why, why are the guerrillas uh, going to warfare right now? Why do you believe? Well, I think there are a number of reasons for it. I think a number of them are have gone in this direction because they feel it is the only way to correct the social, economic, and political injustices in the area. I won't deny the point for a minute. Okay, then maybe they do have a point then. Uh, sure they do. Because of the, uh, to, uh, the totalitarianist uh, government that they do have, uh, the military rule uh, isn't getting the land reforms there. My, I my agree sources with that. indicate that the land reforms uh, aren't uh, going well, they're not doing enough, and that is the main reason why the leftists are rebelling, because they cannot, they cannot see in the re uh, reasonable future where the the people are going to get the land. They believe that uh, the power that is there right now is setting itself up to remain in power, and therefore they're trying to break that down. Uh, could this be a fact? Well, your statistics and mine on the land reform obviously disagree, and <coughs> also I would remind you that the, the Parliament, the Salvadoran Constituent Assembly, just renewed the land reform law about a month ago. But anyway, we can argue those facts and who's right or who's wrong all day. Let me <coughs> try to make the point in a related way. The Salvadoran guerrillas are closely related to, allied with, and dependent upon the regime in Nicaragua, which was established again through revolution, but in the process overthrew a hideous dictatorship in Nicaragua, no question about it. I would ask you to look at what's happened in Nicaragua since the fall of, <coughs> of Somoza and give you just the two most recent examples. The most recent being the censorship of the church in terms of their ability to broadcast Easter services last Sunday, where the Archbishop himself was, pro was prohibited from using either radio or television unless he had first submitted his sermon to the state authorities for <coughs> censorship. He obviously refused to do so. The handling of the Pope in the earlier visit, I think, again demonstrated that the all is not well in Managua. What we have seen in Nicaragua over the course of the period since the revolution succeeded was a move from what was hopefully a process of democratization in Nicaragua to one in which in fact the far left has moved steadily to repress the freedoms that were developed shortly after the revolution succeeded. There is no longer a free press in Nicaragua. There is fast becoming no longer a free church in, in Nicaragua. It is a country that is now populated by more than several thousand Cuban military advisors and a massive military buildup far exceeding anything the U.S. has done for anybody in Central America. Now, you know, all I guess I would ask is that to the degree you make judgments about governments which I will call friendly to us, those same standards need to be applied to others. And if you apply those same standards to Nicaragua, I do not think you come out with a very good example. So what's going to happen in Nicaragua? Are they going to continue to throw money at this problem? Or are they going to start sending troops in and start Who's throwing they? bombs? Who's the United they? States. Uh, the United States is not going to send troops into Central America under any circumstance. Nor is it necessary. Yes, ma'am. Um, back to the El Salvador situation, which you were speaking about before, I was wondering if I could ask a question. Uh, I can't really argue with you because I'm not very informed about it, but you mentioned that what we makes are you think trying I am? to... <laughs> you mentioned that we're trying to 
heal the infection while we while while we stop the current infection? Well, what, are, what, are we what, to I'm, what I'm trying to say, what, I'm, what, what I'm trying to say here is there is, and I don't debate it for a minute, there is in El Salvador a situation that no American would lightly accept of human rights violations, uh, a government that is less democratic than we wish, <coughs> and a government where there is still great, a great deal that needs to be done to develop social justice. I would also argue strenuously that it is light years better than it was a few years ago. But we can have a debate about that. But my point is here we have a situation in which we are trying over time to bring the government of El Salvador to a situation of, one, some stability, but stability within a democratic process. At the same time, we have got to face the fact that the government of El Salvador is under attack from guerrillas who I will argue all day are mainly supported from outside, and that outside support is Nicaraguan, it is Cuban, and it is Soviet, and we have to deal and help the Salvadoran government deal with that attack as well as we have to pressure the government of El Salvador to move toward the building of democracy in El Salvador. Why El Salvador? Why did you pick El Salvador? Because they picked it, not because I picked it. That's where the instability now is, <coughs> is uh, a challenge. And it comes in great measure because of the attitudes of the Sandinista government in Nicaragua, which is not content with doing what it feels is necessary within Nicaragua, but is actively engaged in, I will use the term, and I don't mean it the way it sounds, but in trying to subvert clearly the government in El Salvador. Uh, ask the government of Costa Rica, which nobody argues is undemocratic. It is a social democratic government and it is legitimately elected and they are scared to death of what the Nicaraguans are doing. Honduras now has a democratic government. They are equally scared of what the Nicaraguans are doing. Uh, there are some democratic forces around Nicaragua, if we even argue that Salvador isn't there yet, who feel that what the Nicaraguans are doing is terribly threatening to regional stability. My point is regional stability in that area in the last analysis presents a potential security threat for the United States and yes I'll get to the domino point there is one big difference between El Salvador and Vietnam and that's the Pacific Ocean so and you ought to think about that for a minute what are you going to do with this wait a minute, are, are you a student or are you a yes I'm a oh, student all right, all right, then I'll, wait a minute let me get yes sir well, would you say we're not having involvement at least I got us on a subject uh, we can talk about yeah operations in plus what you say there's not going to be a U.S. involvement in the area. I said but true. the covert operations plus Operation Big Plan, which occurred roughly a month ago, with training Hunter and Army at the border, plus the shipment of the U.S. Army. Well, you know, I've now got to, for I hope the only time today I have to sound like a bureaucrat. It is policy, and I think proper policy, that on questions of intelligence operations, covert operations, or charges thereof, we simply do not comment, and I can't comment on that. I will say one thing, however, that it ill behooves a government such as in Managua that is spending a great deal of money, time, and blood to destabilize its neighbors to be complaining that there may be some guerrillas in Nicaragua who have the same intention with regard to the government of Nicaragua. Uh, you know, if the shoe fits, they ought to wear it. And even the Nicaraguans are hard put to say that they are not involved in what's going on in El Salvador, though they try. But uh, what's sauce for the goose is sauce for the gander. Jonathan, oh, you moved up. I couldn't find yeah, you. I, I, I thought you'd I, given up and I left. <laughs> no, I never give up. Um, do you honestly think that uh, Duarte is, is he really going to move to uh He's got to get elected first. Well, okay, let's say he gets uh, elected. Um, do you really think he's going to move to democracy? Or is the United States basically just supporting uh, a government that would be fascist, but fascist <coughs> on our side? Do you know, do you know anything about I, I, I've asked the question wrong. You, let me give you two minutes of history of Mr. Duarte. He was legally elected president of El Salvador in the early 70s. The exact year escapes me. 
his I think his vice presidential candidate was a fellow named Ungo, who is now the leader of the guerrillas, and was a social democrat. It was either his vice presidential candidate or his opposition, I can't remember which, but they were both engaged in the election. Duarte won, was shortly thereafter overthrown by the Salvadoran military, put in the pokey, and tortured. Now, you know, you can say whatever else you want about Duarte, he may turn out not to be an effective leader or whatever else. You cannot challenge his credentials with regard to his belief in the democratic process and in democracy. He went to jail and was tortured for those beliefs. But now he acted as provisional president prior to the last election. Again, you, you and I will get into the same argument again. It was under his leadership <coughs> that the land reform, whether you think it was enough or not, you can't deny there was some, that the land reform took place. It was under his leadership that there were major movements within the Salvadoran establishment to remove the oligarchy, to get them out of the country. It was during his period of leadership that uh, some moves, at least, were made to bring the Salvadoran military under some central government control. I'm not saying he's even going to it's not even clear he's going to be the candidate now, but he is potentially the, the candidate of the Christian Democrats. I don't know who's going to win the election, and I'm not saying Duarte will be the next president of Salvador. I am saying that when he acted as provisional president, he moved, I think, <coughs> fairly substantially in terms of leading the Salvadorans toward a, a better democratic system. The fact of the matter is, however, that if there is a free election this fall and they elect a president, whether he's to our liking or not, is not any longer the issue. Because they, if we agree that democracy means that you have to be able to select your own leader, then if they select a five-headed monster, they've at least elected their own president. I happen myself to think that uh, the process in Salvador has moved, it has moved well, and whoever is elected president the next time, the process will continue to move. But I can't promise that. All I can tell you is our intention is to do everything we can to make sure there's a free election. I'll get back to you, but let's see if there's anybody else first. Yes, ma'am. If, let's say, a communist was elected to the government and another guerrilla uprising were to come up, would we go in again? How far can we carry containment? Well, what do you mean, go in again? We are, I mean, you mean assist in the meth in, in giving a military assistance and, and economic assistance and so on. They elect a communist, that's their business. Uh, I don't understand the, the question. Okay, you're, we're, we're supporting democracy, of course, and you're saying we, have, we no longer have a choice who they elect. If, let's say, a communist official were elected, yeah. right? Um, and there was another guerrilla rising or we support that? I don't know. It's, a, it's an iffy question I couldn't possibly no. answer. If, you know, if the communist leader is elected democratically, and I think it's very unlikely to happen, but if a communist were elected and it was a democratic process, uh, we might not, we wouldn't like it much, but I think we'd have to live with the fact that that was the outcome of the election. I think it's highly unlikely that's going to be the outcome of the election. Let me, make a, let me make a point. I was ambassador to a country which is far away from here, I admit. But uh, Yugoslavia is run by the communists, and uh, we were able to maintain a perfectly legitimate and open relationship with them. Uh, we don't like the fact that there are communists in the French government, but we maintain a relationship with the French government. But that's not the spot where it is. Yeah. I agree it isn't. No, and I, I'm all saying I'm saying is I don't know what the answer to that would be, because you'd have to judge it at the time. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Aren't those uh, Western European nations, communist governments, offshoots of World War II? Eastern Europeans, right. yeah, yeah. Well, there, you know, there isn't a one of them I think that would have been freely elected. They were put there <coughs> because the Soviets liberated those countries. Is, it, is that the same as in Afghanistan? Would you say is that the same process? That the Soviets would like it to be, but you know, you have to distinguish Eastern Europe from Afghanistan in a number of ways. The most important of which is that at the close of the Second World War, the Soviets had some hundreds of divisions sitting in Czechoslovakia, Eastern Germany, Poland, and so forth. And it's very hard to argue with that number of Russians. And they imposed their own government, and they have been able to keep, keep those governments there since. In the Afghan case, the Soviets had, you know, clearly through their own subversive efforts, had developed in Afghanistan a government which they thought was going to be closely enough sympathetic to them that they wouldn't have to do anything. The fact of the matter is that the government they overthrew and replaced with Babrak Karmal 
was a government largely put in through their own machinations, but they didn't like the fact that it acted independently. They now are stuck with a situation in which they have 110,000 troops in Afghanistan, and that's not enough by a long shot to maintain total control of the country. They can control the cities and the highway, but the countryside by and large is not in their hands. It's in the hands of the guerrillas. They call them Mujahideen. Uh, those guerrillas are probably amongst the world's toughest fighters anyway, and it would take a great deal more in the way of a Soviet investment of military power in Afghanistan to even come close to imposing their system in the way they have in Eastern Europe. And I think it's highly unlikely that they are going to be prepared to pay that investment. So I think what we have to expect is a kind of a continuation of the situation we now have in Afghanistan, unless it begins to be expensive enough for the Soviets that they decide they have to find some way out. I don't think the evidence is there that they're yet there. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. You said that, or she asked a question referring to uh, if the communists would be elected in El Salvador. And then you said that we've maintained a good relationship with Eastern European when you were in the UK. I said Yugoslavia. I didn't yes. say Eastern okay. Europe. Because of the communist government there, you said that that could be perfectly open and public, possibly in El Salvador, if there was a communist there. Is that what you're I'm saying that under, you know, she's asked. Yeah. What I emphasize again is a terribly hypothetical question. Yes. I am simply saying that if a communist is elected through an open democratic process, it becomes extremely difficult for us to argue with that outcome, since we happen to argue, and I'm arguing rather vehemently today, that the Salvadorans ought to be able to elect whomever they want president. I don't think they're ever going to elect a communist president, so I don't think it's ever going to become an operative question. If it does, then she says, well, you know, supposing other guerrillas start, what would we do then? And my answer is, I don't know. I'd have to see what the situation was. I can't answer the question. Yes, ma'am. Way in the back. Um, okay. um, looking at the present government, it's not more power anymore. And um, about the right-wing death squad, how do you justify supporting a government that may call itself a democracy and may say that it's carrying out land reforms, but actually it's killing <coughs> civilians? killing Americans, whatever, supposedly in this fight against the guerrillas. Um, Have I stopped beating my wife? <laughs> it's not a question of justifying U.S. support for a government that has death squads. The death squads, to the degree there are any, and there are, but I mean, there are a lot of people who run around killing people. There are not very many of them, in my view, if any, anymore, who are directed by the central government to go out and kill these people. There is no question there is a strong right wing, and they, like the left wing, have methods of dealing with people that nobody can accept. And nobody should accept, and I'm not trying to defend that. What I am saying is that this issue, like so many in foreign policy, is not the black and white issue that your question implies. It isn't a question of we either support this bunch of right wing nuts who go off and kill people, or we step back. Because if we step back, and if the Soviets and the Cubans continue to help supply guerrillas in El Salvador, and they take over, I have, you know, my, I don't see any demonstration that uh, things are any better in Cuba, or in the Soviet Union, or in Nicaragua. What we are trying to do is establish a government in a situation in El Salvador where the right-wing nuts go to jail for doing that sort of thing, and it's stopped. And indeed, the same happens with the left. We're not de I'm not defending the death squads. I am saying that over time, we ought to be able to establish in that country a system that per doesn't permit that. But I can't deny that it goes on. But I ask only ask you again, what are the choices? Now, I, my friend over here, every time I mention the Soviets and the Cubans, he turns purple. But argue with me, if you will, but the evidence is, I think, overwhelming. And you can't argue, you can argue with me, but I won't believe a word of it when you tell me that in Nicaragua things are great. Yes, sir, you haven't had a chance yet. Yeah. According um, to a clergyman from Nicaragua at a recent conference um, who works for the government, the Sandinista government, he said that if, um, if we supported the Sandinistas, in other words, we turned around our support, um, they would be more than happy to accept the U.S. and that by not supporting them, we're actually pushing them um, to the Soviets, to where they can get aid. 
Yeah, I've so. heard the argument. I think there's several points to be made there. One, the fact of the matter is if you look at the period immediately after the collapse of the Somoza government, you will find, and the figure now escapes me, but you will find that the U.S. supplied substantial economic assistance to Nicaragua for some period of time. During that same period of time, the Nicaraguans, the Nicaraguan government proceeded in the direction it's gone ever since, which is more and more restriction of, dom of domestic liberty, closing down the press, and so forth. We, did, we spent a fair amount of time under the Carter administration and in the early days of the Reagan administration providing economic assistance to Nicaragua. Secondly, you know, it is an argument that can be made and can, there, and can never be disproved because, you know, it's a, it's a what-if kind of an argument. The fact of the matter is that inherent in the argument he's made, however, he is admitting, it seems to me, that the process I have tried to describe as proceeding in Nicaragua is, in fact, proceeding. Why do they have to go to the Soviet Union for assistance? I mean, if what that means is that the country finally sinks into the sea from the weight of the tanks and the cannons and the aircraft, that's the kind of assistance they've gotten from Cuba and the Soviet Union. Massive military assistance. What real, and you know, I don't care what you say, 3,000 guerrillas running around in northern Nicaragua, which is about what the news reports indicate there is there, that is not a threat to the national survival of the government of Nicaragua. Why do they need all those forces? The Hondurans don't have them. The Salvadorans don't have them. The Panamanians, Costa Ricans don't have them. What is their threat? The assistance they have gotten, largely from the East, is far more military assistance, military training, and military advisors. Uh, you know, to me, the argument is a specious one. They, they had the economic assistance from the U.S. In the same time that that was going on, they moved to close down domestic liberties. Secondly, when they turned to the Soviets and to the East for assistance, it was not economic assistance, it was military assistance. I'm going to try to see, is there any, you haven't had a chance yet. Yes. I have a really general question. <clears throat> Do you feel the Soviets um, have a master plan, <clears throat> excuse me, behind uh, using all these uh, third world countries as puppets and uh, feeding them fire to fight? Do you feel they have a master plan in any way with this? I've spent enough time in government to know that if you have a master plan, you very soon have to forget it because it's out of date very quickly. I don't think the Soviets have some, you know, they don't have a group that sits there around the table and figures, all right, now how can we stick it to the U.S. today? <laughs> and what, how can we, you know, outmaneuver them here? I think they have a general set of principles to their foreign policy. One, and uh, cardinal to that is there shall be no challenge to our absolute authority in Eastern Europe. That's point number one. It goes beyond that, I think. Uh, but where I think they are good, and where I think the closest I could come to saying a master plan, which I, I don't think they have. I is, you know, no, I understand what you mean. But I think where they, they are good at taking advantage of targets of opportunity. Instability in country X, <coughs> and they you know, they have an ability uh, to play that to encourage it, which is why, uh, you know, the question of economic, political, and social justice ought to be important to us anywhere for our own national interest, if none other, because its lack is an area where the Soviets can play, although I think far less now politically can they play in this arena. It has to be military. The Soviets, I think, by and large with the third world have lost their credentials over the course of the last decade. Most of the third world understands that you don't get economic assistance from the Soviet Union. That what you do get, if you get anything at all, is military assistance. So I think the political appeal that the Soviets used to have is no longer there. I think they can, and on occasion, on a numerous occasions, I think, do play around through trying to support, support subversive movements. And they have found a technique that they've used reasonably effectively of late, which is Cuban troops in Ethiopia, Cuban troops in Angola, uh, where those can make, you know, in countries and in situations such as those two areas, for example, the Yemen is a third area, where a few well-trained troops can make a major difference, and I think that's been an important technique. But uh, I don't want to leave you with an impression that the Soviets 
they've got it all mapped out for the next 10 years. But I also don't want to leave them with an impression that I think they are, by and large, philanthropists either. So they have no respect for weak powers, obviously. No, I think, that, let me reverse the question, I think the only thing they do respect is strength. Right. There's a young lady back there who hasn't had a chance yet. About in Europe, do you think that the United States has the same re relationship with Yugoslavia since they are communist as it does with Russia? Or is it more open and not easier? No, there's quite a difference. The, the, the Yugoslavs broke with the Soviet Union in 1948, refused to accept general Soviet leadership and uh, remained communist but argued that they were going to develop their own kind of communism. And, you know, I, I'm not saying that we accept as a principle that we think <coughs> communism makes sense. I think we, it's clear we do not. But I think what we've also said in the Yugoslav case is you manage your own affairs as long as what you're trying to do is not to threaten the West or Western interests or our allies in Europe, uh, we will support you. And in essence, we will support you in part because you have made it clear to the Soviet Union you want to act independently. You don't want to be a part of their camp. So uh, I wouldn't argue that our relationships with Yugoslavia are anywhere near as close as they are with our allies. But on the other hand, we have been able to develop, and uh, over time, I think, a fairly productive relationship with the Yugoslav. And in the process, for all of you who think that we are totally benighted, demonstrate that uh, conservative American administrations can live at peace and with a certain amount of cooperation with uh, communist regimes. Yes, sir. So the bottom line is containment with lots of economic aid, easy on the military hardware, right? The bottom line is uh, that's, you know, in its own way, it's too negative, and it, because it comes to a point I should have made early on. One of the great strengths that we do have in this country, if we would only remember it, and indeed, in general, we have in the West, is that we have some values that the rest of the world would like very much to have a piece of, and they have to do with things like liberty, freedom of the press, freedom of religion, and so forth. And we take those so much for granted that we get a little embarrassed when we try to talk about them in public. And every time I go <coughs> off and make a speech in Europe or someplace, I keep trying to raise this, and I see a lot of people sort of wiggle around nervously because, you know, that hokum is just not the sort of thing diplomats ought to be talking about. I think it's our greatest strength. And I think in that sense, it isn't a question of containment. What we ought to be trying to do is be on the offensive where we can, in particularly in the third world talking about the values of democracy, trying to argue that in the last analysis those values don't threaten anybody and that they do offer some hope that the people can answer their own problems. So, you know, yes, containment in the sense that I think we have no choice but to react when the Soviets push, but more than containment in the sense that I think we've got a lot of good material to sell and we don't sell it well enough. Economic assistance and military assistance have to be tools of our foreign policy. But the point I tried to make at the beginning was those are ever more difficult tools to use because the Congress is ever more reluctant to give us the funds to make, them, to make those programs work. So while economic and military assistance have to be a part of our foreign policy process, I think we have to recognize that they are harder and harder to sell to the Congress and to the American people, and that less and less money is likely to be available over, a, over the long term to affect events. Military assistance, I come back to your point, military assistance, you know, is important in a much narrower focus than the economic assistance, so and like we have Pakistan. to do a lot more, we have to do a lot more on the economic than the military side, I agree with that. But then you agree with, like, you know, sending planes to Pakistan in isolated, isolated areas, you think we Absolutely. should strengthen up that? Absolutely. I would only, put, you know, just to make the point on Pakistan, take a look at a map. I know that again sounds like Bismarck or something, but uh, take a look at a map and take a look at how far Afghanistan is from the mouth of the Persian Gulf and look at the only country that stands between 
Persian Gulf and that, and think about how much of our Western oil comes out of the Persian Gulf. And you have to, at least I think, I get paid to worry about some of those things. And if tomorrow morning the Persian Gulf were closed off because we stood there with our finger in our ear instead of doing something about it, you'd all be after my neck. It's there. Uh, in the back. Yes, okay. sir. Uh, how much patience is the uh, Reagan administration going to have for Israel with respect to Lebanon? When are they going to start adhering to, by like, getting out of Beirut, etc.? Well, <clears throat> the my you know my own judgment on where we are in terms of Israeli withdrawal from Lebanon is that the Lebanese government and the Israelis have worked out a lot more of the arrangements than appears on the face of it to be the case. The Israelis and the Lebanese are done with our sort of being involved through Phil Hobby, are down to really one or two basic issues still remaining to be solved. Uh, it's you know it's my judgment that those issues can and will be solved in the not too distant future. Don't ask me to give you a prediction how long it takes, but I think not too much more time. It's the government's view that the Israelis, ha and indeed all foreign forces, have to get out of Lebanon. But I would ask you at the same time to remember that as we deal with getting the Israelis out of Lebanon, we must not lose sight of the legitimate Israeli concerns about its own security. The fact that northern Israel had been, you know, shelled, that terrorists had come in and blown up schools and so <coughs> forth, simply can't be forgotten. And a lot of those, the source of those attacks was in southern Lebanon, when the PLO was largely a government within a government in southern Lebanon. So I think the Israelis have a legitimate right to say, we can't let that happen again. And it's, it's our obligation, it seems to me, to recognize that that is a legitimate concern, and I think we have. And that therefore, as we go about getting the withdrawal of the Israelis, the PLO, and the Syrians from Lebanon. We do so in a way that tries to then reestablish within Lebanon a situation which won't permit that sort of threat to develop again. And the way you do that, and I'll give you an example of military systems where it makes sense. The way you do that, in part, is by major U.S. training of the Lebanese military to get them up to snuff as, a, as an organized military force military assistance to provide them the weapons and the ability to police their own country. What happened in Lebanon was that you had a Lebanese military over time that was split and torn apart and totally ineffective, and an organized PLO military presence that was more powerful than the, government, than the military forces of the government of Lebanon. And it is what led, in great measure, to the mess we now are in there. And if you want an argument of where I think it makes great good sense to be providing military assistance, it's in a case like that to the Lebanese so that they can get back and be sovereign in their own territory. Because Lebanon is not a threat to Israel. The PLO was. You th do we have five minutes? Oh, yeah. You think I'm going to have sure. a, it's going to be a long answer to a short question? Is that <laughs> I really want to try to, you haven't had a chance at it. Um, if the war between Iran and Iraq gets larger, like surrounding countries get involved, what would be the um, United States it's, response? Well, it's extremely dangerous it, it, because that whole area of the world, given the oil, particularly the oil, but the, <coughs> the closeness to the general Middle East, to Israel, so forth, it is a really dangerous area. If you know, our position t with regard to Iran and Iraq in that war has been total neutrality. We will not supply either of them with military or economic assistance. We won't sell them arms under straight commercial terms. Uh, again, it's a, it's a kind of iffy question I can't answer in the sense, if it, if it got worse and involved other countries, uh, I think we would have to look very hard at what we might be able to do, but I am not predicting we put troops in or anything else. I'm simply saying I think we would have to face the fact that it is a tinderbox, that uh, a whole lot of very serious U.S. and Western interests could be threatened if that war expanded 
and we would have to uh, we'd have to make our judgments against that recognition that there's real danger there. I can't tell you precisely what we would do. I also have to tell you I don't think that war is going to expand. Uh, it's it's now kind of a war of uh, attrition, and the Iranians crank up these major attacks. Largely in the forefront are 13, 14, 15 year old kids. And they come in waves and they gain a little territory, and the Iraqis kill an awful lot of them. Uh, and I don't think that's likely to change. But it is a war that, as, as it goes on, it is a constant danger of, of expansion, and one that uh, we would like to see settled, but we have virtually no influence in, with either party. Trying to, is there anybody who hasn't asked a question yet? Yes, sir. Um, getting back to Central America, you said you. you admitted I thought I'd gotten away from that. <laughs> <laughs> um, you admitted that I'll there try are, are social injustices. What, are the, what is the U.S. doing at this time to solve those problems? Yeah. <laughs> Point one, I said earlier on every sparrow that falls from the sky is not our responsibility. So it's not just our responsibility to try to solve those problems. But, if we, but we are, no, but we are, you know, recognizing that there is a principle that countries don't intervene in the internal affairs of others. Nevertheless, ha that having been said, we have made it very clear to the Salvadoran government that if they expect to continue to get military and economic assistance, there are going to have to be some changes in performance. We are pushing very hard, and at this point, so far I have to say without success, but I think indications that we will be successful, to bring to trial the murderers of the uh, nuns. They are under they are under arrest. They have not yet been brought to trial. What about Guatemala? Well, let me do the Salvador. Have you asked what we are doing in Salvador? We, we are also moved very hard, and I think with success, to persuade them to develop an electoral commission, which will try to establish the conditions under which the election will take care take place this fall, including and this is a critical point trying to establish conditions where candidates can run with some security. It is not easy to get out and campaign if you're afraid you're going to get shot in the head when you're up making a speech, so that we're trying very hard to develop some provisions that candidates can be secure. So anyway, I think we're trying to do some things in Salvador. Guatemala is a pretty much a different case. Number one, we do not provide any real economic or military assistance to Guatemala. Some AID stuff, some aid programs, but nothing massive and no military assistance. We are there, and, and because it's a different situation there where we're not as deeply involved, it is, we are in a far less advantageous position to try to push into <coughs> some reform. That having been said, we have told the President of Guatemala on more than one occasion that if he really wants to develop a relationship with the U.S., there are going to have to be some major changes in the country. Uh, you know, if you would all like us, like me to propose a military assistance program of several hundred million dollars so we'd have more influence in Guatemala, I'd be glad to see what I could do. But you see that, you know, there is, it's not totally facetious. You can't totally gripe at me for not changing the situation in Guatemala unless you're prepared to recognize that in order to have some influence in that country, you sometimes have to have programs which provide you with the influence. Yes, sir, I think I got, we got time for No, we don't. I'm, we have to be there at 12.05, right? We all have to meet in the Wisconsin room at 11.15. I hope you mean 12.15. I mean, we're late. late. I think oh, I'm sorry, no, I'm, on <laughs> I'm on Washington time. I take it all back. I'd like to thank Mr. Eagleburger. This certainly has been very right. informative. And once again, would everyone please...